Hello and welcome to the Suzanne Atwell Show. I'm Suzanne Atwell. In this edition, the 2020 election. Our focus, voting rights, reasonable expectations, and public confidence in the process. We begin with a lesson in civics, demographics, and history. From the White House to City Hall, the stakes are great, opinions are hyperpolarized, the volume of rhetoric is deafening. As of August 30th, 2020, there were 14 million registered voters in Florida. Just over 5 million are Republicans, 5.2 million Democrats, and a significant 3.6 million unaffiliated. These numbers show how evenly the state is divided. Here in Sarasota County, it's a different story. Republicans have nearly 50% of the total registered voters. Democrats, about one third. And again, a large unaffiliated block. Florida is an important presidential swing state, not only in the popular vote, but we also have the third largest number of electoral votes in the country, with 29. The number of electoral votes in each state is determined by the sum of representatives in the U.S. House plus the two Senate seats. 48 states plus the District of Columbia have a winner-take-all, meaning whoever wins the state's popular vote is awarded the state's electors. There are currently 538 electoral votes, 270 wins the election. Five times in American history, the president has been elected by winning the Electoral College, but not the popular vote. Three times, Florida played a defining role. In 1876, Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat Samuel Tilden both claimed victory in three southern states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. In a backroom deal known as the Compromise of 1877, Democrats gave up the election and the contested electoral votes. In return, Republicans agreed to the withdrawal of federal troops from the South. So ended post-Civil War Reconstruction. In 2000, it all came down to Florida, where George Bush had a razor-thin lead over Al Gore. Recounts and lawsuits ensued. The U.S. Supreme Court settled the matter, ending the recounts. All of Florida's electoral votes and the election went to George Bush, even though Gore won the national popular vote. In 2016, Trump lost the popular vote, but won the Electoral College, thanks in part to Florida, where he beat Clinton but with less than 50% of the vote. Once again, Florida is in the national spotlight as we approach Election Day 2020. This time, Amendment 4 to the state constitution is center stage. The restoration of voting rights to convicted felons who have served their time. In 2016, 6.1 million Americans could not vote because of felony convictions. In Florida, that amounted to 1.7 million people, 10% of the adult population, 21% of the African American population in the state. In 2018, we passed Amendment 4, which overwhelmingly restored the right to vote. But the state Senate and Governor DeSantis defied the spirit of the Amendment 4 with a bill that required fines and fees to be paid in essence, a poll tax. Suits and countersuits work their way through the courts and remain unsettled, although a limited number of plaintiffs had their rights restored. A Sarasota woman also had her voting rights restored. We'll talk with her later in the show. But first, everything you need to know about our voting from our own popular and trusted supervisor of elections, Ron Turner. I started by asking Ron about changes made and lessons learned since the notorious Bush-Gore debacle in 2000. 
So several things that have been done since the last presidential election in 2016. One, here in Sarasota County, we've worked with Homeland Security and the FBI uh, to try to make sure that our, our systems uh, are as secure a, as we can make them. Uh, we've had meetings with them. We've participated in tabletop exercises, those sorts of things. One of the things that was recommended to us was that we add a sensor to our network in the county called an Albert sensor. And that sensor uh, picks up traffic in and out of the network here in the county and is monitored um, through a, a, a 24 hour a day, seven days a week monitoring center. Florida uh, joined, Florida acquired one of these sensors for the statewide voter registration system. And then each supervisor of elections in Florida and in every county also acquired one of these sensors for their county. And we were the first state in the United States to have 100% of our counties and our state uh, join this uh, sensor uh, network uh, consortium here. So that's one thing. The other thing I'd remind voters is, is we vote on paper ballots and the voting system is not on the uh, public facing internet. So we keep that system, it's a closed network system. And I think those things are just some of the kind of important parts of election security. So give us a primer on uh, different ways Floridians can vote, mail-in ballots, um, uh, absentee, in person. What right. are we dealing with here? Well, so three, there are three ways to vote in Florida, which is a great, uh, great thing. And I, I love that about our voting process because it gives people choices. Mm -hmm. Because I know, especially this year, you know, there's been a lot of conversations surrounding vote by mail. And remember, vote by mail is just another name for absentee ballot in Florida. It started in 2002 as no excuse absentee voting. Uh, a law was passed in Florida. And then in 2016, the Florida legislature changed that name to vote by mail. So little else has changed in 18 years about that process. But Florida gives three ways to vote. So you can vote by mail, but you have to request that ballot. We don't mail vote, we don't mail ballots to every voter in the county. <clears throat> a voter can request a ballot for a single election or through two general elections, right? And we just, at that point, just mail a ballot through, the two, through those two general elections, uh, any election that a voter is eligible to receive a ballot in. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can vote early, which is in-person early voting. And for the general election, there will be 14 days of that at eight sites in the county. It's the most uh, number of days and the most sites we've ever had for early voting in Sarasota County. And that is, uh, to me, early voting is almost like a hybrid of vote by mail and election day voting. It gives you some of the convenience of vote by mail because you can choose any site. So you could be going to Publix or to a doctor's appointment and it's just more convenient for you to swing into one of the sites and vote. You get to vote on the same check-in equipment, voting booths, tabulator, ballot box. You use the same equipment that we use on election day, but you get to choose the site and when it's convenient for you during the time. And then of course the traditional way is election day with the polls being open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So you've answered a little bit of the question, but uh, uh, on the process, uh, once a ballot's cast, steps from verification to tabulation for each manner of voting. Okay, so vote by mail. Uh, a voter has to request a ballot. Yeah. The ballot is mailed to the address on file. The ballots are not forwardable. If a voter wants a ballot to go to another address, the voter has to provide that forwarding address to us in writing. It's not even something we can take over the phone. It has to be a written thing. That is a security element also. Then on the return envelope for the vote by mail ballot, a voter has to sign that envelope, executing a voter certificate saying that this is, in fact, their ballot. They have, they have voted. I am who I say I am. I'm Suzanne Atwell or I'm Ron Turner, right? And then we verify each and every one of those signatures that comes back on those vote by mail ballots. Those signatures are compared to the signatures in the voter record for the individual voters. Uh, if for some reason we can't verify a signature, we contact the voter to start a process to be able to potentially cure that vote by mail signature if we can do so. Um, however, if not, uh, ultimately any potential ballots that are going to be uh, potentially rejected go to a county canvassing board, which is made up of a county judge, the supervisor of elections, and a county commissioner or an alternate for the county commission this year that they've appointed. And the three of us 
uh, meet in a public meeting, and we're the only ones that can reject a vote by mail ballot, ultimately. My staff can't do that, or I can't do that on my own. So once we get those ballots back, 22 days prior to the election, under the law, under state law, we <clears throat> are able to begin uh, processing, opening, and tabulating those vote by mail ballots. So we begin the process of opening the envelopes. We have teams of individuals from uh, both of the major political parties. We make sure we have bipartisan and, and we act in a nonpartisan way. And <clears throat> we have individuals that are paired up and they start to open those envelopes and they will pull out the secrecy sleeve and the ballot and start stacking them up mix that stack up, and then start to pull those ballots out of each of those. That is to protect the secrecy of the voter, so we can't match up the ballot back to the envelope. <clears throat> and then once we get through that process, we start to tabulate those ballots. We run them through high-speed scanners, and those uh, scanners are not providing us results. We don't know the results yet, but we're able to go ahead and put those through these high-speed scanners so on election night, at after 7 o'clock, the first results that you begin to see are the vast majority of vote by mail and early voting uh, at that point. Because people often ask, well, when do you tabulate the vote by mail? Or do you only count it if it's a close race? No. Uh, individuals who vote by mail get to vote. They get their ballot first. They get to vote first. Their ballots are tabulated first. And the results for vote by mail are the first results to come out after the polls. Coast. So they get the first of everything. All right. Amendment 4, <clears throat> the restoration of voting rights mm -hmm. for felons. Do we know how many we have uh, pending in uh, Sarasota County? Uh, for us, you know, how many people that impacts in Sarasota County, I can't be... Um, you know, sure, I, I don't have that number. I've, sure. I've, you know, heard estimates from different groups and things. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say about Amendment 4 and voter registration is that when someone registers to vote, they're applying to register to vote. And one of the questions they're asked, if, there were, if, um, if they're not a felon right. or if they have been convicted of a felony, if their rights have been restored. Mm -hmm. So if it's up to an individual voter to know if their rights have been restored, whether they paid their fines or fees, if they fulfilled all their obligations. And, and they can check with the clerk of the court in the county and the jurisdiction That's where- That's the process. They, if, right. The um, clerk of court. Or public defender, whoever represented them. Okay. There, there are a few different ways, but th there's not one database to check kind of this information statewide. Interesting. So they apply to register to vote. Uh, we enter that information they're giving us into the Florida voter registration mm -hmm. system. And then we wait for the state of Florida to give us kind of a green light or, sure. or not at that point mm -hmm. on um, someone's eligibility. Interesting. 20 years ago, 2000, Bush v. Gore, how did that election change the way we deal with elections here? So 20 years ago when I went through Bush v. Gore, I had my hair was not quite as gray as it there. is right yeah. now, Suzanne. <laughs> um, so what has changed during that time? Well, one uh, is that we do have three ways to vote now, right? Uh, we didn't have that. Early voting didn't exist. And back in those days, for an absentee ballot, as it was called, you had to have an excuse. You had to be absent from your precinct, absent being the root word of absentee. So whatever that reason was, and that changed over time, um, you know, the, the absentee laws change over time. So, but after 2000, no excuse absentee was created. In-person early voting was uh, created. Those were two things. So it provided three ways for people to vote. Um, it allowed us to process, like now, we process vote by mail ballots earlier than we were able to, you know, back then, which is a great thing, especially this year with the volume that we're talking about, not waiting until election day, uh, like some states may. COVID-19 has had a, a huge impact mm -hmm. on mail-in voting. Talk to our audience about that and what that's going to mean to this entire election. So certainly before, we, before COVID came on the scene in Florida, um, we were already anticipating at least 100,000 vote by mail ballots in this presidential general election because vote by mail has been growing over the years. Frankly, vote by mail and early voting have been growing in popularity in election day turnout uh, in numbers has been declining by the thousands over the years. Uh, more than 60% of voters in, in 2016 
in the general election voted before election day, either by mail or early. Mm -hmm. Typically, it was about a third of the voters voting early, third by mail, third on election day. It was, it was like that. With COVID, um, I suspect that we will have more than half of voters voting by mail in this election. Um, for our personnel, we do have face coverings. Um, you know, I was wearing a mask before I came in, mm -hmm, came in mm -hmm. today to sit down, but we're socially distanced you right bet. now. You bet. Um, but I want our viewers to know yes, that. exactly, of course. <laughs> uh, but we, wear, we will wear facial coverings. Mm -hmm. uh, we will keep check-in stations socially distanced so voters aren't sitting next to each other. Voting booths will be socially distanced. Right. Lines will be socially distanced. We will have tape on the floor to show, just like they do at some of the retail establishments, what social distancing, what that six feet look like. Uh, we will clean styluses that we use to check in, wow. pens between each voter. We clean routinely clean services, uh, you, you name it. And then we will have signs up encouraging voters to wear face coverings mm -hmm. and social distance. We can't require that, not even in the municipal jurisdictions that have ordinances. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something enforceable during elections because that's a whole different, it's a whole different thing when you're talking about someone's voting rights under the Constitution, I know, I know. and I can't impede that in, in any way. So on a final note, um, what is your message, your ultimate message to registered voters as we count down? If you are voting by mail, my message to vote by mail voters is if you haven't already made that request, go ahead and make it now because ballots are going out now. And once you get that ballot and you're comfortable voting it, return it as early as possible because we start opening and tabulating three weeks prior to election day. So it helps us be more efficient to get those election results timely mm -hmm. after 7 p.m. on election night. And then my final message is, is we're here for the voters. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in the supervisor of elections office, we love what we do. We're very passionate about voting rights and creating a fair and accessible um, process for everyone in Sarasota County, regardless of their political party or where they live. Um, and if voters have questions, to so please reach out to us. They can call, they can email, they can stop by and see us, or even tag me on Facebook or Twitter. That happens on a daily basis also. So just reach out to us. We're here to serve the voters of Sarasota County. Uh, we're here for them. Thank you, Ron. Very informative and helpful. And if you live in Sarasota County and have questions, visit sarasotavotes.com or call the main number at 941-861-8600. Next, a very special person, Betty Riddle of Sarasota. She fought her way out of drug addiction, she fought her way out of prison, but her toughest battle was fighting to recapture her right to vote. It happened earlier this year at the polling station at Robert L. Taylor Community Complex. She arrived before sunrise on election day to make sure she was first in line. She brought three generations with her, daughters, granddaughters, and a great-granddaughter. They paid witness to her restoration, her rights, her voice, and her dignity. When you're in prison, and up on your release, they tell you that it's like when you finish one sentence, you start a life sentence. And that means they tell you, okay, you finish with this sentence, but you have a life sentence where you can never vote. Okay. And um, you get to a point where you, you, you get to a point where you live it. You say, okay, I never vote, so I'll move on with my life. And that's, you know, that was me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went on with my life. And I bought a house, bought a car, went to college, got a degree. Mm -hmm. I did everything, living a productive life in society. And um, back up in 2019, I met someone from the ACLU mm -hmm. that told me about they fight for former felons' right to vote. It was really hard for me, you know, because I got turned down in a lot of places because of my priors. So once that started, I realized that my voice actually can be heard. For the first time in my life, like I said, I was adjudicated as an adult at 17. Mm -hmm. So I never voted. Mm -hmm. This would be my first time ever voting. 
And that's where my fight began. Um, I, went, I was introduced to a lawyer out of New York, and she asked me to be a plaintiff in the lawsuit. And that was my journey, my fight always in the end. So even though um, Florida passed the constitutional amendment to give voting rights to felons who've served their time, Republicans in Tallahassee have fought it. So when did you realize that this isn't right? This isn't right what they're doing, and why should you have to pay to vote? After they, um, six months in June, when they passed that law where court costs and fines, and I was, I was telling myself, I go, court costs and fines, why do we have to pay to vote? Because me personally, I never thought it was court costs and fines. I always felt like it was a poll tactic because they knew that we could never pay that kind of money. They knew we couldn't find all these, if you was one person that I met that traveled all over committing crimes and attic, couldn't find them. So they knew this would stop us. When they imposed this, this would stop us, majority of us from voting. How did you literally find out what you owed? After they came out with that, me and my supervisor, we called the clerk of court. They told us we would have to come down there. So we, you know, we walked down there because it's down the street from where I work. And we asked her about it, and she gave me all the court costs and fines that I owed from 1989 up until now. Mm -hmm. Then I had another court, court costs and fine out of Hillsborough County. Mm -hmm. I called them. This was in 1989. It's like none exists. I don't exist. It's been so long. It's like he say that it purged. It just fell off. I understand you have 24 uh, grandchildren. You have a wonderful family. What do they say about all this? How is that going? What do you impart to them? What you've been through? They're happy that I'm fighting. They're very proud of me that I'm fighting. They don't agree with what's going on, and they stand firm with me, and they say, Grandma, just keep fighting. Mom, keep fighting. And my kids are the most supported team I have besides my attorneys and some of my coworkers on my job. And, and so as an African-American woman, what do you tell um, your children and grandchildren about equal, equal voting rights and all that? stemming from a long time ago, the, the entire civil rights struggle, what messages do, you, messages do you give them? I let them know that if they ever get in a situation where their rights are being questioned, always fight. Okay, this, I can't really explain it to them why in a, in a politic perspective, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they wouldn't understand, but they know what they're doing to me is unjust. Mm -hmm. Not only African American, but anyone, you know, like, Anyone that's low class and is not and struggling to make money, it really doesn't matter the color. It, it mm -hmm. could be like, but me, it could be Mexican, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans mm -hmm. that hit that was hit the hardest, mm -hmm. that would never vote because they can't find a way to pay. And some of them don't understand that they have a right, exactly. and they don't understand that they can do that because we have people over here that don't speak English, and it's very hard to translate to them. So one of my Things was to go out and, and have someone that speaks Spanish and go there and explain to them that, you know, maybe your mother or your grandmother, them are United States citizens and they have a right to vote, you know. And then I go like every Saturday, I get out from 12 and help register people to vote mm. and also let them know that that is a donation going around to help them pay their court costs and fines. This will be your first time to vote in a presidential election. Yes. It's a big one. Yes. This is huge. Um, not asking anything about who you're voting for, but what is the most important quality you'll look for in this very important election as to who we elect as our next president? Someone that's open and willing to make a change in their life and to bring in justice for our African Americans and the protesters and it's just so much they could do to make this world a better place because we was a unity four years ago. Yeah. We came together, we was a unity four years ago when we had another sitting president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just got divided for the last four years and there's so much anger and animosity going on. That's why it's so important for us to vote to make a change, mm -hmm. to get that unity back together. It's a we, it's a we thing. Yeah. It's yeah. like we have to come together as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. now 
because of that law passed, we need votes more than anything because for the people that can't and will not be able to pay the core costs and fine, we need not only the young generation, but everybody that has the ability to get out and vote, to vote because that is our backbone. Wow, Betty, that is a powerful call to action. And she's right. Voting really is a unifying act. It is also our last best chance to change the course of our deeply divided republic. We turn now to the art of political science and the calming academic voice of a familiar guest, Professor Frank Alcock of New College. We started our conversation with Amendment 4 and whether the governor's bill is akin to a poll tax. I consider it a poll tax. Uh, I, I, we stood out as a state that disenfranchised uh, more um, former felons, uh, not, we're not talking about current felons, but former felons that have repaid their debt to society mm -hmm. um, prior to the passage of Amendment 4 in 2018. Uh, I, I think uh, the resistance to uh, outstanding fees and fines uh, surged after it was passed mm -hmm. and it, it's political. There are a number of uh, folks for political reasons that do not want to see uh, a large segment of uh, Floridians uh, gain franchise and be able to vote and so to continue to put obstacles in their way even after Amendment 4 was passed, I, it's a political strategy and a, and a tactic uh, and that's now played out with in, in, in a legal case. If you, you know, believe there's merit uh, in the argument that some outstanding fines or fees right. um, uh, should be considered part of the debt that you have to pay to mm -hmm. society, then I think after the passage you would have an interest uh, in trying to create a very, very clear um, a passage uh, for folks to know exactly what they need to do in order uh, to finish off paying their debt to society uh, and again facilitate you know, th that final step so they can go back out and vote. And we've seen anything but uh, an attempt to clarify on the part of, uh, you know, the, the DeSantis administration. It's actually, I think, willful uh, neglect and a lack of clarity uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of foot dragging mm -hmm. because they, you know, barring uh, them keeping a broad ban on all uh, ex-felons, they just mm -hmm. like to keep you unsure of whether or not you paid your debt to society mm -hmm. to deter you from trying to vote. So I think it's intentional. I watched a lot of that trial with Judge Hinkle. It was, it was quite frustrating when um, a lot of the, it, the bureaucracy up there was trying to find out in the basement of the elections office thousands of unmet uh, liens, uh, victims, trying to separate uh, what you owe the victims, what the liens are. They run from 20 bucks to a lot more. How do you make sense of that, and what would work? What would work to streamline that? Streamline that. Uh, that's a good question, uh, and so clearly there needs to be a great deal of coordination um, between different branches and agencies within the Florida government. I think we have the technology actually to. Uh, uh, to get that information uh, shared and clarified. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not, not happening. Uh, and I also think a clear guidance on the part of um, our, our state secretary uh, and, and supervisors of, of elections yeah. around the state, I think, um, uh, could be helpful. And I'm not sure they're getting clear guidelines. And so a lot of uh, supervisors are sort of left to their own devices of, uh, with respect to figuring it out. And here in Sarasota County, I think we got a good one. And uh, mm -hmm. You know, that, you know that, that's helpful uh, here, um, but it's not the same in other places. So you're a student of Florida politics. You, always, you have been for many, many years. All this noise coming from the White House about voter fraud, mail-in ballots, et cetera, um, is there any historic evidence of that here in our community? No. Uh, and so there is no evidence of... Uh, a, a broad-based attempt uh, to vote if you're not legally entitled uh, uh, to vote. Mm -hmm. There may be instances here or there, um, but the number is incredibly small. The reasons for that um, are that the, the benefit of 
one person or a, very, or a few people voting illegally are, are pretty much zero, the penalties for getting caught doing that are extremely high. So it makes sense you just mm. don't really see this um, all that much. I think attempts to suppress votes are far more problematic for our democracy um, uh, than voter fraud. So regardless of who wins this election coming up, what's your, what are your greatest concerns? Oh, this is a big one. Um, I'm more fearful and anxious um, about the outcomes of this election than I've been uh, at any time in my life. And it's not just the uh, who wins as, as much as I really think, you know, our entire democracy uh, is, uh, it's at a, a fra it's being tested. It's being stress tested in ways that I've not seen in my lifetime, We maybe in ways that we haven't seen in the entire history of our country. And so my concerns are that uh, when this election is over or that we get to the end of election night, um, we may not know um, who won mm -hmm. um, uh, and there might not be agreement on who won or whether it was a fair election mm -hmm. and there might be ongoing resistance uh, to accepting the outcome uh, of, a, of an election, uh, no matter how uh, it ends exactly. up. Right now, we're in a very bad place, and I think mm -hmm. um, across the country, uh, regardless on what side of the aisle uh, you orient yourself, um, mm -hmm. I think there's there's a strong sense that I, I may not accept the outcome of this election unless it goes the way that I want, and that's a big problem. Um, so it seems that every time there's a presidential election, um, it's always called the most important election um, in our lifetime, and it is often hyperbole. But from a political science perspective, um, how do you look at governance and politics in general right now? I think the reason that democracy uh, works and it's better than the other options uh, is that while we can debate, deliberate, and compete uh, in order to advance um, our conception of the common good, um, we, we realize that there's something more important um, from cycle to cycle, which is the integrity of the system itself. Uh, and so that we all come together and continue to do what's in the best interest uh, of the country. Once those principles or sentiments are, are cast to the wayside um, and we'll do anything to get our preferred person into uh, the White House or the, per the person that's in the White House will do anything possible to retain power, um, then uh, we're at a, you know, a, a point we haven't seen before where the integrity of the entire thing is, uh, is at stake. And so I am fearful um, uh, you know, uh, 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 that the current president in particular, um, uh, if it's unclear or even in the face of a, a fairly clear electoral loss, mm -hmm. may attempt to do anything mm -hmm. um, in order to retain uh, power. And my confidence in those that are around them right now and even the Supreme Court and the Attorney General, I'm not sure you know, what they're going to do if, mm -hmm. if there is an attempt to, to retain power in the face of an electoral loss. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm scared for us at the moment. I hope this all works out. Uh, you know, and, and some of my anxiety and, uh, and fears are misplaced, um, but I'll just be honest about them right now. They're, they're at a high point. I think a lot of us are fearful heading into this election, Frank, and many are also fed up. We've had enough. The noise and the chaos is overwhelming. But that is exactly what despots and authoritarians count on, apathy the cancerous accomplice of the collapse from within. So on the eve of this election, my friends, let the light of truth and reason guide your choice. Be motivated by the inspiration of Betty Riddle. And no matter what, make sure you vote. To learn more about the election, Amendment 4, American history and voting rights, visit the links on your screen. And you can always watch this show and all our past episodes on my website, Facebook, and YouTube pages. That wraps up another one. Hope you learned something and enjoyed the show. Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Suzanne Atwell. We'll see you around town. <laughs>